going to start by telling you a story. It's a true story. <clears throat> well, it's as true as I can make it with my limited memory. So one time, I was at a hockey game with my son. He was playing hockey. He was a little kid. He was about 11 or 12. And he was a pretty, he's an enthusiastic hockey player. So it was always really fun to go watch him. So this year, he'd been in a lot of really bad hockey teams, but this year he was in a pretty good hockey team. So we were watching the little championship game that was organized in our neighborhood at our neighborhood at hockey rink. And uh, it was a really good game. It was, the teams were very evenly matched and that was partly because in our neighborhood, the way the hockey league works is they set the kids up and each kid can ask to play with one friend and so they try to make it desirable from a social perspective. And then they let the kids play a few rounds and then if one team is really, really good and another team happens to be not so good, you know, luck of the draw, then they rejig the team so that there's rough equality. And so, and they always do a really good job of that and it looks to me like the kids appreciate it. And, and it was a good game, the championship game, because the teams were really evenly matched and so kids on both sides had to really do their best in order to to win. And it was like 2-2 two, two with seven seconds to go and the other team scored. And that was the end of the game. And so on my son's hockey team, my son's a pretty good hockey player, but there was a hockey player on his team that was better. Um, he could skate a little faster, and uh, but he was kind of a star. And that meant, for example, that he didn't pass very much. And, and, uh, but worse than that, in some ways, I guess he knew that he was a star. But worse than that, his father thought that he was a star. <laughs> and so his father was a very clueless person. And it wasn't long after this that his marriage collapsed. And I would think deservedly so. <clears throat> because he was a clueless person. Um, his wife was also about equally clueless, so they deserved each other. <clears throat> and it was unfortunate, I suppose, that they got divorced because now they can go inflict themselves on other people. <laughs> Anyways, the teams came off the ice and the star came off, and he was really mad. And so he was looking all you know, narcissistically arrogant, and he banged his hockey stick on the cement once he got off the ice, and his dad came running up and he said, it was stolen from you guys, you really deserved to win. It would have been much better had you guys won. And I thought, I always thought you were an idiot, but it's pretty obvious that that's, you're such an idiot, it's just hard to even imagine. But why, why would I think that? Because, you know, think about it. His kid was the best hockey player on the team. And they lost. So, what was wrong with him consoling his son for the loss? Well, it's very frequently the case that the things that we do every day that we're not really aware of are actually deep things. They're almost always deeper than we can possibly imagine, and that's because we're not really aware or intelligent enough to understand what it is that we do, or why we do it, or what happens if we do it badly, or what happens if we do it well. And so, one of the strange things that we tell our children is, uh, it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose. It matters how you play the game. And children often, when you tell them that, they sort of nod and look blankly at you. <laughs> and often, you don't act like that. I mean, my wife and I went to many hockey games, and some of the things we saw on behalf of parents were, they're just jaw dropping. We, we, we saw one guy, all he ever did during the whole hockey games was put his lips, there's, you know how they have those plexiglass protectors? There's about two inches of space between them. He'd put his lips in there and he'd yell at the referee 
the whole game. And he only had about three phrases. I, one of them was, hey, stripes. And he must have yelled that like 150 times each game. You just wanted to hit him with a stick, which is not a good thing to do if you're a Buddhist. <laughs> but I'm not a Buddhist, so I'm perfectly, it's perfectly OK for me to engage in those sorts of fantasies, which I actually do quite frequently. <laughs> So then you might ask, OK, OK, so, so it doesn't matter whether you win or lose. It matters how you play the game. Well, what the hell does that mean? And does it mean anything? And is it true? Well, it, it actually turns out that not only is it true, it's even technically true. And that's even better than just true. It's demonstrably true. And that's because life isn't a game. Or we could say life is a game, but that's not all it is. Because a game only happens once, but life happens continually. And so there has to be a relationship between the thing that happens once and the thing that happens continually. And a lot of what we regard um, patchily and contradictorily and with a tremendous amount of existential angst as morality actually happens to exist because of our collective attempts to attempt our collective attempts to solve the problem of the relationship between something that only happens once and something that happens continually and that's what I want to talk about today I want to talk about desire and how it manifests itself. And then I want to talk about like meta desire in a way and how that manifests itself and why and what that means and, and really what it means because it really means something. And it means something like it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, it matters how you play the game. I want to tell you why that's true in a way that is understandable and not merely parroted. So I'm going to start with a proposition. This figure will be familiar to some of you. But the proposition is this. And this you might regard as a Buddhist proposition. Because the Buddhists believe that we live in illusion. And that that illusion is somehow self-generated. And that's true. In, in a remarkable manner, because it turns out that what it is that you desire at any moment absolutely shapes your perceptions. To a degree that 15 years ago, psychologists would have found improbable. We know now that when you look at the world, you don't see much of it, because you actually don't have the neurological wherewithal to see much of it. You have to screen most of it out. And by most of it, I pretty much mean all of it. And I'm serious about that. The world's very complicated. You're, you don't see anything of Africa while you're sitting in this room, for example. And you don't see anything that's outside of this room. And in fact, you probably don't see anything outside of the screen. And you only see a very little bit of the screen. And then you don't even really see the screen, because the screen is made up of micro elements that you're completely unaware of. And, then the screen, of course, is nested inside this massive institution that's nested inside all sorts of other systems. And you don't see any of that. And so what do you see? An answer to that seems to be something like a very limited range of tools and obstacles that are relevant, however you calculate that, to whatever your narrow current goal is. And so if you notice how you're all sitting, for example, First, you're sitting facing the front, so we can presume that whatever it is that you see is at the front, and then your eyes are all pointed more or less at me at the moment if you're listening, or at the screen if you're looking at the screen. And So then, if you're looking at me, you probably see roughly my eyes and my mouth, and that's about it. And if you're looking at the screen, well, then you have to point your eyes all over the screen in order to pick up the words on it. And so, you look at what you want to look at. And then you see, in some sense, 
what you would like to see. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that, obviously, because the world just doesn't provide you with what you want to see. You have to wrestle with it to make it give up what it is that you want. So there's constraints on illusion. And the constraints are reality, I suppose. But nonetheless, you do live inside a little structure that's sort of like this, that, that desire produces. And some of you will have learned about the idea of drive, and some of you will have learned about the idea of goals, and some of you will have learned about the idea of deterministic behavior and stories and games. And this is my primitive graphic attempt to integrate those, and it's, it's based on a fairly straightforward idea, and the idea is the framework through which you look at the world, which you might think about as a lens in a sense, always has a certain minimum number of elements. And one of those elements is the characterization of your current state of being, or of the most evident element of your current state of being. So that could be not enough blood sugar, not enough water, not enough oxygen, not enough sexual activity, not enough play, not enough friends, not enough status, etc. An array of complex states of, we'll call, deprivation that at their most fundamental point, at the most fundamental level of analysis, are biological in origin. They've evolved. They're evolved systems. All of those systems that I described. Not only are they the starting point for, for your desires, they're also the starting point for the desires of most of the animals that you're related to from a biological perspective. These are evolved systems. And, so, and some of them that you would expect to be sort of secondary, like status, turn out to be the most primary systems of all. So you could make a case that your desire for status, which is an intense desire, is as old as your desire for, for sex, anyways. It's old. You share it with animals that are so far down on the evolutionary chain you can hardly believe it like lobsters, crustaceans, for example, have the same status-seeking circuitry that you do, runs on the same neurochemical substrate, and has the same behavioral consequences. It's unbelievable. So part of desire is the necessities of life. Now, what those are is not a straightforward thing to determine, because what you actually need has never been clear. You can bind it a bit. We know that if you don't have food for long enough, you'll die. And if you don't have water for even a shorter period, you'll die. And you die even faster if you don't have air. And so some of these things are relatively obvious. But some of them aren't so obvious at all. Like babies die without touch. We didn't figure that out until probably 40 or 50 years ago, literally. Like if you feed a baby and you take care of it and all that, you know, like you provide it with the so-called necessities of life, but you don't touch it, then it dies. So who would have guessed that? Not the Romanians. I mean, <laughs> well, the, look, the thing is they didn't know. Like 100 years ago in North American orphanages, in hospitals and so on, 120 years ago, if you were a baby and you were in a hospital and you were abandoned and you were under a year old, the probability that you die in the first year was basically 100%. You know, we got there a little earlier than the Romanians, but not that much. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, you know, it's a dreadful fact. And, and, you know, there's other basic needs too that, that you wouldn't think of as basic. Play appears to be a basic need as well. So it's, there's a circuit. You have a circuit for play. And it, the utilization of that circuit seems to... It's an unbelievably important circuit, which is why we suppress it constantly in our schools. And uh, <clears throat> it's really what helps children become moral. <clears throat> and that's partly why I started this lecture with a story about a game, playing a game. Well, when you're 
When you haven't got what you want, which is pretty much all the time, then you have some sense of what it is that you do want. And so that comes along with it. So it's like when you're looking at the world, you don't just look at the present. You look at the present in relationship to the future and the future in relationship to the present. And you do both of those at the same time. And you always do that. And you can't get out of it. You're always doing that. If you're not in one of these frames, you're in another. And <clears throat> these frames sort of manifest themselves at different levels of resolution, which is a useful concept. And you could say that the lowest resolution frame is something abstract. So it might be something like be a good person, where the highest level re of resolution in relationship to a frame is, well, one of the things that a good person does now and then is smile. And smiling is actually not an abstract, is not an abstraction. The word smile is. The action smile is the movement of your lips. And if it's a real smile, your eyes as well. That makes it a Duchenne smile. And people regard those as genuine, unconscious, actually. They're from the bottom up and not from the top down. You're not smiling at someone like you're a predator. You're smiling at someone like you're cooperating with them. And that's a Duchenne smile, as I said. And that's not an abstraction. The reason it's not an abstraction is because you're using your body to do it. You're using your musculature. You're using your embodied being. And abstractions, see, we're kind of clueless, modern people, because we think abstractions refer to descriptions of the world and that the world is made out of objects. And that's both of those things are wrong. A, abstractions do not refer to objects, generally speaking. And B, the world isn't made out of objects anyway. So both of those things are seriously wrong. And because we believe those, we can't understand the relationship between the mind and the body at all, because our first principles are wrong. Part of the highest, re one of the highest resolution elements of the abstraction, be a good person, is move your lips so that the ends curl up. And you can't get much more detailed than that. Or you can't get much more detailed than that with your consciousness because you can move your lips, but you don't know how. So your mind meets your body at the level of voluntary control of the musculature. And the concepts that we regard as moral are made up of motoric subroutines at their highest level of analysis. So, and you can see that if you think about something like a hockey game, because what do people do in a hockey game? They move their feet back and forth, and they move their head around, and, and they have this kind of throwing motion that they use for a slap shot, which is something that human beings are particularly good at because we're based on a tracking and hunting platform. And so we love to throw things at moving things. And we'll get stadiums full of 40,000 people to watch people who are really good at throwing things at other things, or hitting things with other things, or throwing something into a goal. And because that's what human beings do all the time, we're always throwing something at a goal. And usually the goal is a moving target, like an animal, for example. But even in your conceptual realm, you're always aiming at a moving target. You even know what that means metaphorically. I don't know what your goal is, but you can be sure it's a moving target. Because the world changes, right? So you have a highest value, say, and that's a moving target. And you use your hunting platform body to orient yourself towards it and aim at it. And like we, we're all evolutionary biologists, hypothetically, but we, n none of us think that way. Not really. And so this is an example of how deep in our psyches the fact that we're predators is actually embedded. So there's the frame. And it's a story, in a sense, it's, or a game. And it might be a story because you might say, well, I was at point A, and then I went to point B, and here's how I got there. It's not necessarily a very interesting story, but it's sort of like the basic unit of story. And then it's also a game, like a Monopoly game. So what's the point of a Monopoly game? <clears throat> well, that's hard to say, actually. It depends on your level of analysis. But you could say, well, it's, to, it's a zero-sum game. You have to get all the money and all the property, and then you win. So winning is one point, but then, well, that's the competitive element of it. But then there's a cooperative element, which is, well, look, you're all playing Monopoly. So you've all decided that the, the goal is to get all the money. You, it's a little collective decision. It's a weird one. I mean, why do you care? 
Well, you do care once you decide that you care, and that's interesting because one of the things that that demonstrates is that you can sort of decide what you're going to care about. And I think that's part of the human capacity for abstraction is that we have these underlying biological systems that in some sense have set motivational content. So if you're deprived of H2O, then you're going to crave and seek water, and that's built into you. But our cortical structures, which emerged out of these lower, more primordial systems, and are still structured deeply by them, can substitute abstractions for those more concrete, basic states of desire and goals. And, and so it's almost as if we can put anything into the goal box, I mean, and then we act as if it's important. And that's really part of our capacity for fiction. It's part of our capacity for crea creativity. It's part of our capacity for uh, storytelling and, and for imagination and all of these things. And our capacity for abstraction is built on a lower platform that's more primordial, but it still partakes of all the elements of the primordial subsystems because we're constrained by our evolutionary development. Now, then the question might be, well, if you're an aiming sort of person, what should you aim at? That's the question. What should you aim at? And we already hypothesized that you should name it winning. You should aim at playing the game properly. But now we don't know what that means. So we're going to figure out what that means. So the first thing you might imagine is that there's the game, Monopoly. You aim at winning, maybe. Maybe you aim at winning. You don't want to aim at winning too hard because then people don't like playing with you and you get all whiny and you, you, know, you act like you're three years old when you, know, you get this chance card that says you have to pay 50 bucks on each hotel and you put all that work into getting all those hotels and you know, that just shows you whose side God is really on. And <laughs> people react more like that than you'd think and when they react like you know, they're cursed by God when they get the wrong chance card, that's worth noting, which is part of the reason you're playing the game too, because you want to figure out who thinks they're cursed by God, and that's a really easy way to do it. <laughs> Hopefully you also want to have fun while you're playing the game, and there's all sorts of different levels of that. And so you can see that Monopoly is actually a very complicated thing, even though it's simple. And it's also completely bizarre, right, that people will get their emotions all tangled up in that game, even though everyone notices right off the bat that you, you, who really cares who has the most plastic hotels. So, but it just shows you how right the Buddhists are, right, because you can tangle yourself up in a Monopoly game badly enough to lose friendships if you really want to. So that's pretty interesting that people are like that. So anyways, but here's something to think about. So let's say you've got a friend and you play Monopoly with them, and, and that's one thing, and maybe you want to win, but maybe, maybe you really like playing Monopoly, just for the sake of argument. And so you don't want to win so badly that you don't ever get to play Monopoly again. And that's a constraint. And so here's a constraint. It's good to play games. It's better to play games than it is to win them. Or it's certainly better to play games than it is to win one game. So then you might ask yourself, well, what exactly is the formal relationship between winning a game or any number of games and being invited to play the maximum number of games? Well, that's a tough question. Then you might ask yourself, well, who's the winner? The person who wins a game, or five games, or ten games, or the person who gets invited to play the largest number of games? And the answer to that is, well, it's the person who gets invited to play the largest number of games. And obviously. And what that means even is that you could lose 70% of the time, let's say, in any game you ever play, and still come out ahead if you get invited to play enough games, because if you win 30% of the games that you play, and you play an unbelievably large number of high quality games, it's like not only do you rake in the consequences of that, but everyone's thrilled to play with you because they win a bit more than you do every time you play. So then you might ask, well, what do you mean by win? And that's exactly the same question as, well, what do you mean by what are you aiming at? So there's the game. 
and then there's the game of games. And the game of games is more important than the game. Because the game is a subset of the set of games, of the game of games. And the moral rule is, never win the game in such a way that makes you a loser at the game of games. And that's what you're telling your child when you say, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, it matters how you play the game. And that actually turns out to be right, even though you don't know why it's right, and maybe you don't even believe it, but you know that you should tell your child that. And maybe you can act that way, but pro and maybe you do, but, and, but par probably there's part of you that's still irritated that your son didn't win the championship. Now what you see here is a bunch of different kinds of games. There's a rat game on the left, and that's rats wrestle, by the way. They love doing that, juvenile rats, especially the males. They love to wrestle, and they wrestle just like human boys do, mostly boys. And if a rat pins another rat, then that rat wins. But it turns out that if you pair rats together, we know they love to do this, by the way, because they'll work to get the opportunity to enter an arena where they know they get to play. And that's how you define rat desire. If a rat will work for something, you assume that he wants it which is kind of the way we do, the, do it with human beings, with money, right? So we'll assume that's ecologically valid. So you can get rats to work pretty hard to get, enter an arena where they can wrestle with another rat. It also turns out that if one rat is about 10% bigger than the other rat, so he's like the potential bully rat, then he can win pretty much all the time if he wants to. And winning means he pins his partner. But it turns out that after the first encounter, the rats sort of establish a little dominance hierarchy. So each of them figures out who the tough rat is. And then the next time they meet, then the rat that isn't so tough has to do the dog play thing. You know how dogs look when they want to play? They sort of put their paws forward and they look at you like maybe you'll understand them. And they kind of put their tail in the air a bit. And you know they want to play. And rats do that. And they do that to each other. And so the rule is the losing rat in the previous round has to ask the winning rat to play. And so, but. If you pair them repeatedly, the, the big rat, who could win all the time because he's the big rat, has to let the little rat win at least 30% of the time, or the little rat won't ask the big rat to, let, to play anymore. And so that means the big rat loses the game of games because he doesn't let the little rat win. So if you have any children, the rule is let the little rat win 30% of the time. <laughs> So that's rats, and then in the middle there's girls, and then there's boys, and the girls are playing tea party. And that's a really complicated game because it involves uh, the sharing of food, which is something that women are particularly good at, and uh, biologically speaking, and that's something very unique about human beings, and perhaps even particularly unique about women. And um, it's very deeply rooted inside human beings. Um, it's very, when I had little kids, it was very interesting to note that they would spontaneously share food, really pre-verbally, which I thought was just mind-boggling, because you think about it as a complex cognitive ability, but it's way deeper than that. Sharing food, that's something. I mean, and getting it right, that's something. And we don't get it right much anymore because we don't think it's very important. So that's why most of us are fat or have eating disorders. But it turns out that it really is important and that's why girls like to play it. I mean, boys will play too. They kind of get grudging about it if they're invited to a tea party. But, you know, they'll sit and have some tea if they have to. And then, and that's kind of how they learn to play with girls. And one, of the, one, one thing that's kind of interesting is that chimpanzee leaders, so they're at the top of the dominance hierarchy, the bully types, <clears throat> coalitions form against them and then they, bad things happen to bully chimpanzees if coalitions form. So they often end up losing extremely vital parts of their anatomy during dominance disputes. Whereas the more stable chimpanzee leaders don't seem to elicit male coalitions so easily to rise up against them and throw them over. And that's partly because they'll, they'll have tea parties, so to speak, with the female chimps. So the stable chimp Males, the stable dominant chimp males, have good relationships with the females. They're much more cooperative and egalitarian in a sense than you might expect a dominant male to be on pure power dominance theories of domination. So anyways, the girls are having this tea party and the boys will do that. And then the boys are wrestling. Girls, they don't like to do that so much. but. 
If you're a father, you can get your little girl to wrestle if you're kind of careful with her. Now the boys are wrestling, and they're having a good time, generally speaking. They'll have a good time as long as there are certain rules that are observed, and the rules are, well, if you're big, you know, don't throw your weight around. You've got to let the little guy poke you in the eye now and then just so that he feels tough. And, and, but there's way more going on with wrestling. It's like, well, how hard can I hit you in the nose with my elbow? And, you know, how hard can I poke you in the eye? And how hard can you hit me before it's actually painful? And, you know, when should I whine about it? And when should the game stop? And when should I cry, if ever? And exactly how far back can my arm bend? And exactly how far back can your arm bend? And what happens if I kick you? And it's like, this is all embodied moral wisdom, eh? Because you've got to figure out exactly how your body responds, not only to you, but also to other people before you know kind of what your limits are and you have to be able to distinguish between what's a real threat and what's a play threat and what's actual pain and what you're just whining about and how much pain you have to tolerate if you're going to get the guys to continue to wrestle with you and how much you know how much fortitude you should show in the face of pain and god it's unbelievably complicated it's all done embodied you don't have to talk about any of this you just have to wrestle around and all this comes out in the wash and it's sort of how you get your body nicely wired up so you can move it around without being a total klutz and even more importantly than that it's kind of like a collective dance and that's what you see with the bo little pile of boys wrestling here and the collective dance is well not only how do I use my body but how do we both use our bodies against each other in a manner that's mutually reinforcing for lack of a better word and so that the game continues and so that the metagame continues because the metagame in this situation might be wrestle with your friend. Well, friend implies you want to play some more games with the person because otherwise they wouldn't be your friend. And then you have to figure out how to wrestle so that you don't screw that up. And that's very, 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 very complicated. And you don't have to talk to do that. And that's a good thing because it's too complicated to talk about. You have to do it. And Piaget, among others, has pointed out, well, this is part of the basis of morality. It's the deeply embodied sub-element of morality. Where does my body end? Where does your body start? How do we do the same things in the same space, etc.? And all this can be negotiated non-verbally, and that's kind of cool, because one of the things it implies is that you get a lot of your moral knowledge. It's embedded inside of you. It's part of your procedural circuitry and that's built in relationship to other people who are doing the same thing so you're mutually shaping each other in this collective game and the collective games of games and you're building your body so that there are things that you can use but so that there are things you can use in an environment where a whole bunch of other creatures that are sort of like you are also using their bodies in the same environment to play games and to play the game of games and all of that's happening without speech, or could be happening without speech. And then it's not, of course, just wrestling or tea parties. It's all the games that children play. They're all doing the same thing. And then it's all the games that teenagers are playing. And then it's all the games that adults are playing. And that's all a huge collective nonverbal negotiation. And it's one that's been going on not only for the centuries and eons that we've been human beings, but for thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and millions and hundreds of millions of years before that. So here's, here's something to think about. We have revelatory moral wisdom. In some sense, that makes up the basis of part of our religious traditions. You might ask yourself, well, where did the revelations of moral structure come from? Well, one answer is God, and actually that's not a bad answer, but you might want to, to fill the gaps in a little bit between the revelation and God and see if you can figure out how the message gets to you from God, so to speak. And part of the answer to that is because of this collective act of negotiation, negotiating our bodies in games and games of games, we've saturated our own being and also our collective cultures with the drama of how to act as an individual in a group. We act that out. That doesn't mean we've mapped it, not, not declaratively. We, we, we can play the game, but we don't know the rules. Not all of the rules. Because the rules turn out to be very complicated, because the game is something like, well, I need to survive, and you need to survive, and you need to survive, and here we are in the same place. And then there's all these other people that want to survive, and then there's all these other animals that want to survive, and then there's the foreigners, and then there's today, and tomorrow, and next week, and next month, and next year, and a hundred years from now, and a thousand years from now, and a hundred thousand years from now, 
now, and every single one of those different frames of reference is a different kind of constraint, and the game that evolves and the metagame that evolves has to satisfy, has to satisfy all of those constraints simultaneously. And that's really, really, really hard. And we don't know how to do it, but we do it. So we don't know how to say how we do it, but we do it. Or maybe we do it. Because we're always afraid the whole bloody thing is going to come crashing to the ground and there'll be an apocalypse. And that's always a possibility because those sorts of complicated structures can fall apart, especially if people are incautious. And they're often incautious. And you can be incautious by breaking a rule. Well, what's that stupid rule for anyways? It's like break it and find out. The fact that it's there, even though you don't understand why it's there, doesn't mean there's no reason for it. What it means is that that rule is holding back a, uh, an ocean of chaos, just the kind of chaos that God uses to flood people when they don't behave properly. And you don't know it's there because there's the wall, and all you see is the wall, or maybe you don't even see the wall. You don't know about the ocean behind it, so you poke a hole in the wall, and well, look the hell out when you do that. Which is why most cultures are very conservative. They're very conservative. And they've figured out that just because you don't know why something is there doesn't mean you should poke around in it. Now, let's look at this neurobiologically a little bit. So we're going to talk about a structure called the hypothalamus, which psychologists don't, human psychologists don't talk that much about because human psychologists are what do you call them? They're corticocentric. You know, we need another thing to, what would you say, to resist prejudice against. And modern psychologists are prejudiced against non-cortical systems because they like to think that their prefrontal cortexes, which sort of separate them even from chimpanzees, are the important parts of the brain, and they're not. The important parts of the brain are these parts that are hardly even there at all. And they're really, really tiny. This is a rat brain, by the way. That's called a flat map, so it's like the brain's being flattened out. And this is the, the brain from the bottom. And these are really old, 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 old parts of a system called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus, man, it's important. If you take a cat and you take off its whole brain, limbic system, so to speak, cortex, you leave it with nothing but a spinal cord and the hypothalamus, which is so small you can hardly even see it, and it's a female cat, and you keep it in a cage, you can't even tell it doesn't have a brain. Because it can keep doing all the things that it did before. So it can mate, it can eat, it can drink, it can breathe, it can uh, defend itself, that's pretty cool, it can a engage in reproductive activity, it's like, there's a whole cat there. It's got a few problems, so one thing is it can't remember anything. So because it does, in fact, use its cortex to remember things. And the other thing is that it is, is it, that it is hyper-exploratory. Now that's pretty weird, because you'd think a cat with no brain wouldn't be exploratory at all. But what that indicates is that most of your brain is there to help you not explore things all the time. And the question is, what things should you not explore? And the answer to that is things you've explored before. Now, a cat with no brain can't remember what it explored before, so it's exploring everywhere, and it's hyper-exploratory, and so that's, and that's interesting. Now, the hypothalamus has two elements, roughly speaking, although, as you can see, there's a bunch of little sub-elements, and that's the hypothalamus over there on the left, too, and so it's not one thing, because nothing in the brain is one thing, no matter how you analyze it, if you keep analyzing it at higher and higher resolution, you find that it's more and more and more and more and more things. And so we give brain areas names, but the names don't correspond to homogeneity. And that's the case even with the hypothalamus. It's made out of a bunch of subsystems. And those subsystems do things like tell you when you're thirsty, but they do more than that because the hypothalamus isn't just a drive machine. So the hypothalamus not only tells you that you're thirsty by making you feel thirsty, but it also tunes your perception so that if you look at the world, you're much more likely to look at it as a world in which you could and should find water. And so as your hypothalamus determines that you don't have enough water in your blood, then your perceptions start to tune out everything that's irrelevant to water search and they, in, they, they um, also activate mechanisms that inhibit any kind of motor activities that would be associated with anything but the search for water. And what basically happens is that 
you see the world as a place to get water, and then you go get water, and then poof, the hypothalamus has you do something else, because now you're hungry, and then you're not hungry anymore, and well, now you're tired, so then you go sleep, and then you're, you know, sexually desirous, and so hopefully you can do something about that, and, uh, you know, then there's the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and that's hypothalamic life. It's one damn thing after another. And so you're in a constant state of desire, and the desires change, but being in the state of desire is something that doesn't change. And you have to be in those states, because otherwise you die, and hypothetically you don't want to do that. And so evolution has made you very loath to die. Now, so that's interesting, and so you've got all these little monsters inside your head. Those are Freudian, like, id monsters that they don't drive you exactly. They set up these little stories that you live inside that make you act like a unidimensional cyclops in the search of some particular necessary biological goal. And so that's fine. But it's a bit more complicated than that, because what happens if your search fails? Well, you can't just grind to a halt like a computer would, because then you die. You have to do something else when what you're doing doesn't work. And your brain's figured that out for you, which is kind of helpful. And the hypothalamus has actually figured it out, because what happens when you don't get what you want is partly that you get anxious about it. And that's actually a newer system, and, and it's also painful, which is also a newer system, and we're not going to talk about that. You stop because it isn't working, so you should stop at least after some point, and then you explore. And what's so cool about the hypothalamus is that not only is it the system that tells you what to do when you know what to do, but it also is the system that tells you, to do, tells you what to do when you don't know what to do. And what you do when you don't know what to do is to look around and explore. And what's cool about the hypothalamus is that the impulse to explore is just as old as the impulse to drink water, or to eat, or to engage in sexual activity, or maybe even, maybe not, but maybe even to breathe. It's not epiphenomenal. It's way down there. It's an old, 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 old system. And so then you might ask yourself, well, if all of these little hypothalamic goal structures are games, and they are like the game of getting water. You know, you played the game of life when you were a kid, maybe if you're as old as me, and that was all about getting the necessities of life. That's your hypothalamus for you. But it also says, well, in the absence of certainty, explore. And so then that raises a, a couple of questions, and one question might be, well, you have these needs, we'll call them. They're more complicated than that. And one question is, well, what should be the relationship between them? What's more important? Well, part of the answer to that is, well, when, and over what time span, and with who, and those are really relevant questions because you're not alone, and good for you because you just die. And then the other question is, how are all these specific systems that are dedicated towards specific sub-goals to be construed in relationship to the goal of exploring? Now, because exploring, that's a weird process, right? Because when you explore, which is what you can do when you've made a mistake, let's say, or what you can do when you're bored, because what, if you're bored, why not explore? And what are you doing? Well, you're foraging, because when you explore, you use the same system that squirrels use to go find nuts, because that's what they like to explore the world for, nuts. And so that's kind of what you're doing, except the nuts, so to speak, that you're foraging for are generally abstractions because you're an abstract creature and instead of finding nuts, you find how to find nuts because you're a creature of abstraction and so we'd rather know how to do something as, as Christ said in the New Testament actually said, if you teach a man, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, if you teach him how to fish, then you feed him for a lifetime, and that's kind of the same idea. It's like, would you rather have a fish, or would you rather know how to fish? And we would rather know how to fish, and that's abstraction. And so when we forage, we forage for abstractions, because they're worth more than the concrete things they represent. And so our foraging systems, which are in black on this diagram, have evolved to forage not for things, but for how to get things. And so if you talk to someone, they tell you how to get a bunch of things, you're really thrilled about that and you'll pay them. And so, so then I would say, well, there's some relationship between doing something and exploring to figure out how to do things. And here's the, and, and then I would say, Jesus, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out all things considered, what's more important, doing things or figuring out how to do them? And the answer to that is, never do things in a way that stops you from figuring out how to do more things. Got it? Right. Well, that's, that is 
morality. That is St. George. And St. George is killing a dragon here, which is what St. George is always doing. And he's rescuing this princess, which is, maybe he's not too thrilled about that because he was expecting a big pile of gold, but it turns out that if you have gold, you can get princesses, so it's basically the same thing. <laughs> Actually, it turns out if you know how to get gold, you can get princesses because princesses aren't that stupid. and You can fool them with gold, but if you force them to make a choice, they'll go for the guy who knows how to get the gold instead of the guy that has the gold and doesn't know how to get it. And that's because <laughs> our tree-dwelling ancestresses were very happy when the first of our tree-dwelling ancestors figured out how to drop a really big stick on a really ugly predatory snake. And that happened a long, long, long time ago, like 60 million years. And so this is a really old story. And here's the story. The story is something like, well, when you're out there doing things, sometimes that doesn't work. And when you're where what you're doing is working, you're in one place. And when you're where what you're doing isn't working, you're in another place. And the place you are when where you're doing isn't working is a chaotic state. And the chaotic state is the state that surrounds what you know, in a sense. And that's where all the predators are, fundamentally. That's when you've accidentally wandered out of your safe territory. And that's where the predators lurk. And the system that we use to conceptualize the things that lurk outside our conceptual system is the same system that our ancestors used to detect predators. So we're abstract creatures. And so we think of prey, predator, but then you could think of conception anomaly. And it's the same idea. And that's why, here, here's a very loose association, but the snake in the Garden of Eden is a predator because it's a snake, but it's also the thing that always pokes its ugly head up in the middle of your paradises. And there's just no getting away from that. And then the question is, well, what should you do with snakes of life? And one answer is you should scream and run or you should freeze, which is what a rabbit would do. But it turns out that if you don't do either of those, if you approach the anomalous thing, then you get the treasure that it guards. And I love this image. It's so intelligent because what it says is that, well, if you face the chaotic expanse of life, then that makes you the sort of creature that appeals to potential mates. And there is absolutely no doubt that that's the case. Because one of the things we know, for example, about women is they mate up and across, across and up dominant hierarchies. They like the dominant guys. Women are choosy maters. Chimpanzee females, by the way, aren't. So then the question is, who's the most dominant male? Well, you know, maybe he's the guy with the biggest sword, or maybe he's the football player, and that's a possibility too. But there's the guy who wins the game, and he's pretty dominant. And then there's the guy who wins the game of games, and he's so much more dominant than the guy that wins the games that they're not even in the same universe. And women, because you can't fool them because they're quite smart, if they have the opportunity, will always pick the guy who wins the game of games over the guy that wins the game. And we know all this, and we express it in our images. And it forms the basis of our religious conceptions. All right, I'm going to go through something quickly here. So, let's do it this way. Here's a little map of my games, we'll say. So I'm writing a paragraph, and so what I do is I, I write a sentence, and then that's part of writing a manuscript, and then imagine that these things are nested. So these are nested games, one inside the other. Write a sentence, write a manuscript, practice science. Embody my professorial role, professorial role. That's, part, that's a superordinate game. Be a productive citizen. That's support, superordinate over professor. Confront the unknown. That's superordinate over being a productive citizen. So then you might think about that archetypally. This is the father and the husband, the middle class businessman, the capitalist personality, the American personality, the humanistic Western personality, the Judeo-Christian personality, the exploratory hero on the outside of that, the sup a superordinate moral system. 
So here's a, here's a set of moral principles. There's the game. That's nested inside the game of games. So never win the game if, if it makes you lose the game of games. The game of games is nested inside the system that transforms games. Because if the game isn't going well, you have to transform it. And the way you do that is by exploring, accommodating, assimilating, transforming the rules. So the game of games has to be subordinate to the process by which games are transformed. What's that subordinate to? The equilibration of all of the systems. I think that's been represented mostly in Christian iconography, but it comes out in other religious systems too, as the kingdom of heaven. So you might say, well, if you go back to this, you might say, is there anything outside of all that? Write a sentence, make it truthful. Write a manuscript, make it truthful. Practice science. Go after something new. Embody the professor professorial role. That's not only discover, but communicate. Be a productive citizen, a broader game. Confront the unknown. That's how you keep the whole bloody game going. What's on the outside of that? Make things better. What does better mean? Well, better is complicated. Better means all of these things, plus the balance between all of them, plus that for everyone. Now, that's an ultimately equilibrated state, and that's been conceptualized conceptually, because we can only conceptualize these things in image, because we're not smart enough to think them up. That's conceptualized in a very deep way, especially in Judeo-Christian culture, as essentially something like the kingdom of heaven. Because, you see, the kingdom of heaven, as a concept, it isn't a state. It's not a state. A state is something concrete. It's like a game, a state. Or maybe a state is even like a game of games if it's a sophisticated state. But there are structures in which we're embedded that are more complicated than any of those things. And they're the real things, like these abstractions I'm talking about, the game of games, the transformation of games. Those, aren't, those are abstractions, yes, but they're not mere metaphors. They're actually descriptive categories for realities that are so fundamental that they're part of the evolutionary landscape across time scales that we cannot see. They're real. When, when Christ talks about the kingdom of heaven in the New Testament, there's a, there's a fair bit of ambivalence about what exactly is represented. But one of the things we know is that it's not a state. So in the Old Testament, for example, there's lots of experiments with states. They all fail. So whatever the ultimate state is, it's not a state, it's something like a meta-state. Well, the meta-state that's referred to as the kingdom of heaven, say, and represented in that way, is what's best for you, all things considered, in relationship to what's best for you, and you, and you, today, next week, next month, next year, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, all at the same time. Now, the iconography is something like this. Now, one of the things that Christ represents, because he's an exploratory hero fundamentally, is the dominance of the process by which rules are formulated and regenerated over the rules themselves. Because Christ, like most savior figures, is a recaster of social mores. So the idea there, and this is something that Piaget knew, is that the person who's capable of inventing new rules is superordinate to the person who can only play by the previous rules. And an aspect of this is also the thing that confronts the dragon of chaos. And those are actually the same thing, because when you allow a social system to deteriorate and disintegrate and become chaotic, then while you're recasting the social structure, you're also fighting off the dragon of chaos, because those two things are exactly the same thing. One more hypothesis, and I should say, this is actually not my hypothesis, this is Jung's hypothesis, probably one of the most, it's maybe the most brilliant psychological idea that anybody ever thought of, ever. And really, I'm telling you, like I've read all the criticisms of Jung, like by Richard Knoll, who's a real weasel as far as I can tell. <laughs> and I have very specific reasons for saying that, by the way. Um, because he accused Jung of doing all sorts of things like starting a cult and so on. And what Jung actually did is so much more radical and unsettling than starting a cult. It was sort of like accusing an axe murderer of jaywalking. So, <laughs> so what did Jung hypothesize? This is so cool. He said, look, 
you are adapted to reality. But reality isn't what you think it is. It's not like the bushes and the, like the cat and the table in your house. It's, it's way more complicated than that because it stretches over contexts and times and you can't see all that. And, but it's there, and not only is it there, it's really there. It, your survival is dependent on it. And so, but you're evolved for that. It's okay, you're evolved for that. How are you evolved for that? Well, he thought that your sense of meaning, roughly speaking, you can think meaning is kind of like that which attracts your attention, we'll say, just for the sake of simplicity. If you're careful and you haven't filled your head up with garbage, which means you don't lie to yourself, so that's like step one. You can't lie to yourself because that screws up your brain and then you can't trust it. So we'll just say you're not doing that or you're trying not to do that. Then your brain orients you to this and that. It says, wow, isn't that interesting? And you don't have much control over that. Your brain just does that. Wow, that's interesting. And you might think, why do I think that's interesting? But you don't know. And so that begs the question, who does know if it's not you? Who's in control in there? Well, Jung's answer was, he called it a mechanism called the self, which was the sort of superordinate you that was superordinate to your ego, and it told you what to be interested in. And what it told you to be interested in was any manifestation of any circumstance that looked like it might be aligned with winning the metagame. So not only can you detect the environment in a sense, which isn't what you think it is, it's more like known and unknown, something like that, at a very high level of abstraction. You can also detect when these invisible elements that you can't see line up properly. And your brain will orient towards that. You think, wow, that's meaningful. Wow, that's fascinating. Isn't there something cool about that? Don't I love investigating that and being in that state of mind? And the answer to that, yes, yes, you do love it. Why? Well, it's not because you're going to get more like Lexuses if you, or Lexi maybe? Lexuses <laughs> if you do that, or may, although maybe that'll be one of the things that happen. It's because your brain is trying to tell you that if you pay attention to that and you're diligent in its pursuit, it's like the, it's like uh, Mercurius, the Mercurius of the alchemists who would lead you to the gold. If you're diligent in your pursuit of that, then everything lines up for you. And even better, maybe everything lines up for everyone else. And then everyone gets what they want. And, and, or maybe it's even better than that, because who cares what you want? Maybe what happens if you're very diligent about that, and you're open to the possibility, and you're not manipulating the damn world all the time, but trying to find out where the Tao flows and, and being part of that, maybe what happens is you get what's best for you, whatever that is. And at the same time, while you're making the world best for you, and that doesn't mean you just get what you want because you're too dumb to figure out what's best for you and who cares what you want. We're going to assume what's best for you. And then maybe it's even better than that because we are so deeply social that there's a place where what's best for you is simultaneously best for everyone else too over long time, frames of time. And you have an inkling of that. You have a vision of it. And that's the vision of utopia or the kingdom of heaven or any of these things. And this is such a vision. One of the things it says is the exploratory hero eternally rules over the kingdom of heaven. It's like, yes, that's right. It's not a metaphor. It's not a metaphor. It's more like a category. And a category and a metaphor aren't the same thing. And then, you know, you could ask yourself ultimate questions, and then I'll stop with that. One is, there's an old idea that goes along with these old ideas. The old idea is, you can only aim at one of two things, or you can sit on the fence. Now, it turns out that the mythology is that if you sit on the fence, that's the worst possible thing you can do. And the reason for that is you can't learn anything. You want to have it both ways. You'll never learn anything. So forget about sitting on the fence. And then the next question is, are you aiming at this, or are you aiming at its opposite? And that's the idea that the human soul is always engaged in the cosmic battle between good and evil. And that also happens to be true. And every time you make a decision, even though you don't notice it, because the decision is a subset of a larger set of decisions, and that's a subset of a larger set of decisions, and, and so on, all the way up to the levels of abstraction that we have been discussing, every single time you make a conscious decision, 
you're making a decision between one of those aims and the other. And even more interesting, I think, is you probably know that. Because I've talked to lots of people about this, and I said, well, so I had a client, she had an affair. I said, look, and, and then she had a dream that if she kept walking down the same road, she was going to enter a terrible storm, and then the affair collapsed just exactly how you'd think it would if you were extremely realistic and pessimistic, because her illusions all fell apart, and she got hurt. And I said, and then she thought this was wrong. And I said, when did you first know it was wrong? And she said, well, he texted me, and it was a little inappropriate. He had, he transgressed, the guy she had the affair with, had transgressed the boundaries. With he, he put a little tentacle out to tap, to see what the response would be, and the response was response. It's like, door opened, and away she went. And you know, six months later, she had her own little piece of hell. And what was really interesting about that was she knew it right away. Just like everybody always knows it. You bloody well know. You look at a situation, two paths open up, you think, I should do this. Then you do this. And you think, I'll get away with it first. No, you won't. My experience has been no one ever gets away with anything. You may be too stupid later to notice the causal sequence that leads to your downfall because of that mistake. But that doesn't mean you got away with it. In fact, the, the idea that you can get away with it is like, that's like the most dangerous idea. I'll close with this. People need, need carrots and sticks, right? So this is like a carrot. So then you might ask, well, what's the stick? Well, the stick is what happens if you don't pursue this. So then you might ask, well, what's the opposite of this? And my impression is the opposite of this is what happened to us in the 20th century. The opposite to this is a kind of totalitarian rigidity that inevitably results in mass genocide. And that's like hell. Or maybe that even is hell. It's certainly close enough, I would say. And it's real. We've been there a lot. And we know from reading the writings of people who've been very careful about taking such things apart, that the way you get to those states of hell, Nazi hell, Mao hell, Stalin hell, is by making that first stupid mistake that you knew you shouldn't make, and then the next stupid mistake, and then the next five stupid mistakes, along with everyone else who's making the same stupid mistakes. And each of those is a violation of personal responsibility and a conscious one. And if 20 million people do that 100,000 times, then you end up with 60 million dead in 50 years. So now we know. We know what this is like, and we know what the opposite is like. And it's becoming increasingly clear how individual choice is related to that. And so that's the carrot and the stick. And for me, the stick was a lot more effective than the carrot. Because it was never clear to me that the kingdom of heaven existed. But after studying 20th century history for 15 years, it was pretty bloody clear that hell existed. It also became very clear to me, partly because of that and partly because of my clinical practice, that hell was not a place that I wanted to live or take people. And so that's what you're deciding, just like all those old stories always said. Okay, desire. What should you desire? The highest good. What's the highest good? Well, that's what I tried to outline today. So thank you very much.